Today's show is about using momentum when upshifting. This is the Pilot Flying J in Carlisle, PA. I ended up in Pittsburgh yesterday for my backhaul when I um, left for work Monday morning, yesterday morning, I didn't realize that they were going to switch my backhaul. I didn't even know where my backhaul was going to be, but then it turned out to be Three Rivers picking up ice cream. It was a beautiful drive, as you can see if you look at yesterday's show. And I made it, Carlisle isn't that far from home, so I made it pretty close to home. Now today I'm going to go deliver this ice cream and then I'm going to do two shuttle loads and have a fairly short day. Going back to the analogy of my uh, pups, I, I used to have two purebred Siberian Husky pups and I had training collars for them, which is a euphemism for shock collars. So when I applied stimulus, whether light or heavy, they would try to figure out what I wanted them to do or what I wanted them to refrain from doing. And they would um, brilliantly figure it out because Huskies are as smart as Border Collies. They're just a lot less obedient. And then I was talking about what would have happened if they could have put a shot collar on me Let's say they were equally powerful, then it would have come down to, in a power struggle, it would have come down to who could withstand shock better and who could apply more better. So one person, our dog, applying shock to the other party in the power struggle could keep me from shocking them. I could say, okay, I can't take it. I'm not going to shock you anymore. Or they could say, okay, I can't take it. I'm not going to shock you anymore. Or they could just bite me in the face. <laughs> you think about dogs with training collars. I, I sometimes wonder why they don't just turn on whoever they know is applying to shock, but they don't. But we can when we're dealing with the gaslighters that I've been addressing in previous episodes, we, we could bite them in the face, we can withstand the shock and not complain and just laugh at them and not comply with what they want, not figure out what they want us to refrain from doing, not figure out what they want us to do. I think with the gaslighters, whether they be the powers of the world, or the universe, or people you're in relationships with of, of various types, friendships, or work relationships, romantic relationships, whether you call those connections power struggles, or power exchanges, which is a more healthy way of looking at it, because in every connection, whether it's animals or humans and animals, there's a power exchange. You see it with pack animals, you see it with chickens, there's always a power exchange. And usually, you don't have two equally matched entities, you usually have one entity that's slightly more powerful than the other. And in these exchanges, sometimes the tables turn. I've noticed that with chickens, they have a pecking order, and sometimes that pecking order changes, and two chickens will reverse positions. And that can happen in relationships too. I've experienced that myself. So if you're dealing with gaslighters at the local level, when you turn the tables and you become more powerful, they will resist. They will try to return things to the status quo that they prefer. And your job is to bite them in the face. 
your job is to, I'd say, provide more shock to them than they can provide to you. Withstanding, being tough, that's good. Just laughing when they apply their puny shocks to you. But why, why allow them to keep shocking you? And the best way to dissuade somebody is to shock them. And it isn't an exploitation. It's, and it isn't even retaliation. It's a power exchange. And in that power exchange, it can be a loving thing. In a, in a relationship with children, and it can go both ways with children, it can be a loving thing. I think it should go both ways with children, by the way, but that's a separate topic. I think that when you're dealing with someone that you've been in a relationship with, and you are done being in the less powerful position, and they resist because they want things to stay the same, you can get momentum. I've noticed in a truck, when you're going from a lower gear to a higher gear, if you have a burst of acceleration right before the shift, the shift goes more smoothly and the gear shift will fall right into the next gear effortlessly. But if you're just going along at a steady RPM and then try to shift, it doesn't work as well. It's not as easy to get the next gear to happen. I think it works that way with a change in power. You withstand the domination of the other person and, and don't let it cause you to comply. And then you turn around and you become powerful and you do what you need to to get the other person's level of concern to go up. We talked about that earlier. And as you shift to the next place of power, you give a little burst of acceleration. An example might be that you're in an open relationship and you are dating seldom on the side, outside of your primary partnership. And then you decide to get a little momentum up so the people, the person maybe that you're seeing, you see more often, maybe at a time when your partner is available too. If you have a kind of a, a long-standing tradition of only seeing other people when your person is busy at work or something like that. And then that's a little momentum. And then you shift into the next gear of dating more frequently and, and perhaps dating new people. And perhaps you avoided that because there was some psychological way that your partner um, raised your level of concern when you did that. And it takes oomph, it takes some determination on your part to, to date someone when your partner also might expect you to be free or to take a walk. And then you do that with someone else instead. Or you go out with friends when you haven't typically done that. And you do that when... You could do that when your partner is out with friends. When you don't usually do that. Or you could even do that when your partner is free. In our culture, we're not free very much. When I, like yesterday, I worked a 14 hour shift and then I babysat the truck all night in a truck stop. So, you know, there's there's not a lot of free time for me this week, Monday and Tuesday, driving to Pittsburgh from my area, which is near, which is in Lancaster County. 
it's really tough to find those extra moments. And when you do, you may have an understanding that you spend them with each other. Or you may find that you're in a power dynamic where one person always makes themselves available for the other when possible, but the other person frequently does things, activities of whatever type, when the other person is available too. And so there could be a shifting in, in the dynamics of your relationship. Okay, so what can throw a monkey wrench into all of the things I was just describing? That's your fear and trepidation. If you're afraid that the person in your romantic connection is likely to just say, okay, fine, I'm done. And then you'll blink first, and then you'll just cave in and go back to whatever power dynamic you already had. So Aaron Dowdy, in his channel, he talks about detaching. He talks about pulling your energy back. He talks about not leaning or I talk about not leaning forward, but leaning back and letting the energy of other people come to you. And that's not asshole energy. That's just confident, relaxed, assured, strong, and steady, crass energy. There's nothing malevolent about it. You could be malevolent and act like that, but... It isn't built in. It isn't a given. So if your attitude is, I'm valuable, I know I'm valuable, and if things don't work out with us in an equal exchange of power, if we can't get to that kind of parity, then okay, I understand. Don't let the door hit you. Because in your own makeup, you've decided then, and this is the new thing about you, that you'd rather have an equal power flow than an unequal power flow. And if this person isn't happy with that, then you can find another person who is. And when you have that kind of energy, what did Eric call it? BDE. But he said instead of big dick energy, it's, what did he say it was? Something else. Big heart energy. B-H-E. He changed it. Either way, it's confidence that you are valuable. And that whatever you want in your life, you can have. And that energy will make you happier with yourself. And it will make you more attractive to everyone else in your life, including the people who aren't sure they want to deal with the new you. And again, an indication that you're on the right track is that you're getting resistance from certain people. You just have to get used to it. You have to say, yes, I can handle this resistance. And I can even rejoice in it because it means I'm on the right track. Remember at the end of the movie, Limitless, when De Niro was threatening the main character, was trying to make sure that the main character was subordinate to him, wasn't going to kill him, he just wanted him to be abused, because this guy was definitely Take useful. Take the exit on the right toward Pennsylvania 283 West. And the guy wanted to be useful for himself, and he didn't want to be subservient to De Niro. So what did he do to get out from under him? He started to say information he knew about it, De Niro that was incriminating. In other words, he didn't just resist, he pushed back and he made room for himself. He applied shock to De Niro's shock collar so that De Niro would let go and stop applying shock to his collar. And it worked. It works every time. When the bald grandpa was asked, hey, why did you just purchase a brand new corduroy pillow? He replied, 
Well, I've always wanted to make headlines. In three quarters of a mile, arrive at home on the right. 